Good morning, Fellowship. Great to be with you. Uh, my name is Rick. I'm one of, part of the leadership community here at Fellowship. It's great to bring the word to you today. I will say a couple of things. The smaller crowd today was really nice. I met some folks I haven't met yet, which was really a fun thing. And I also try to think about today, like we are in the um, we're in the end of Matthew, which is about Jesus' second coming and what's going to happen in the, in the final uh, moments of human history in this planet and this earth and what he's going to do and how he's going to bring that to culmination. So I was thinking about that and some of the teaching we've had. Then I was thinking about the fact that it is a cold, rainy, spring forward, first Sunday of spring. That sounds depressing, but it is true, right? And so I thought, instead of teaching today, I, we're just going to watch a movie. And I thought, <laughs> y'all are okay with that? Because nothing leads to reflection in your life, of, like thinking about the tribulation, more than thinking about the tribulation with Nicolas Cage a part of it. You know what I'm saying? So... <laughs> I don't even know where that goes. So it would be fun, though, just to, to do it and then let all the other teaching, teaching part of the teaching team clean up the mess I created. But we're not going to do that. So what we are going to do is look at Matthew chapter 25, verse 31, at what is going to be a very familiar story. So I have to caution you when you hit familiar stories, your mind goes to boom, 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 this is what it means. It's about the sheep and the goats, separation of the sheep and the goats, if, as much as you've done to the least of these. And so... You know, the immediate takeaway is this is a passage about looking at one group of people who really served and were generous and another group of people who didn't serve and they were generous and the consequences of that behavior. Uh, and that would be way too simplistic. And it would actually be an error. Because we sang about what this song is, I mean, this teaching is about earlier in our song. Remember when we sang, this is our Savior, look at him, look at him. That's what this passage is about. Look at him. Look at him. This is not a simplistic story that fits nicely into Southern religion or trying to get people to do more things for people who don't have things or get people to act more religiously. It's not. That is a story of grace revealed through generosity and the relationship of generosity to the grace of Jesus and his generosity in our lives. One way to say it that it fits for me is generosity never earns salvation in Christ. Salvation in Christ is always evidenced by generosity. That's the bigger story. And if we miss the bigger story, we will miss Jesus in this story. And when you miss Jesus in the story, you actually miss the whole point. You actually are left with religious transaction versus relationship with a Savior who's saying so much about himself and because of who he is, something very important about us. So to set the context, we're actually going to just take a passage that tells the big story of grace. It's just one of the passages of Scripture that has a like a, a broad zoom way back and look at the whole picture. It's Ephesians chapter 1. So if you have your Bibles, turn there. I'm going to mark in a, like an aqua color some words and phrases that will be reflected in the context of Matthew 25, 31 through 46. So here we go, Ephesians chapter 1, verse 1. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly realms. This is a declaration of God the Father, blessing us in Christ with every spiritual blessing. This is a statement of extraordinary abundance. It is about living out of an extraordinary, unimaginable abundance. For he chose us in him before the foundation of the world. This is a story rooted in the beginning and even before the beginning in the mind and the heart and the life of God existing eternally. What happens before the creation, what happens at the end of time and the second coming of Jesus are intimately connected in the gospel story. He chose us to be holy and blameless in his presence, in love he predestined us for adoption as his sons through Jesus Christ, according to the good pleasure of his will. Why, 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 why has he done this? Because he loves you. Yes, because he is merciful. Yes, because he is gracious. Yes, because he 
because he uh, paid the price on the cross, all those things, and ultimately for the why of the praise of his glorious grace, which he has freely given us in the beloved one. This is a, a statement of deep, intimate relationship. In him we have redemption through the blood, his blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses according to the riches of his grace that he lavished on us with all wisdom and understanding. Paul will use this kind of phrasing, the lavish riches of his grace in chapter 1 and chapter 2 of Ephesians because he, there can be no doubt what's happening here. That it's a gift of grace and it's so extravagant because it's not like, okay, here's something for you, here's something for you, here's something for you. Are there gifts like that? Sure, there's a distribution of gifts. Are there resources? Sure, there's a distribution of resources, but the primary gift is himself. If we miss the primary gift is him, we're going to get trapped. And we're going to work harder, do harder, do more, compare, compete, uh, shame. And oh my gosh, now some of you, a lot of you have moved to Tennessee during this whole great migratory process. So if you're from California or somewhere, and you don't understand the level of shame we Southerners put on ourselves, I'm telling you, it's our thing. It's like our thing. We just shame ourselves with religion. And this passage in Ephesians 1 is not about that, nor is Matthew 25 about that. He has made known to us the mystery of his will according to his good pleasure, which he purposed in Christ as a plan for the fullness of time. What is the fullness of time? Matthew 25, we're about to look at it. Here's, here's it all coming together. Ephesians 1, to bring all things in heaven and on earth together in Christ. All of humanity, all of the angels, heaven and earth, all gathered around the throne of Jesus in this scene. This is what's happening. In him we were also chosen as God's own, having been predestined according to the plan of him who works, works out everything by the counsel of his will, in order that we who were the first to hope in Christ would be for the praise of his glory. And in him, having heard and believed the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, you were sealed with the promised Holy Spirit, who is the pledge of our inheritance until the redemption of those who are God's possession to the praise of his glory, which is Matthew 25. Our inheritance coming to bear the redemption of people belonging to him all to the praise of his glory. If we can understand that's the story that we're in, Matthew 25 becomes a very different story than how much have you done lately for the poor, the naked, and the prisoner, and the stranger? And how can you do more? And what can we do to get you to do more so we can all feel better that we're doing enough because we want to make sure when the time comes we get on the right hand of God, not the left hand. This completely changes the story. Okay, so here's the setup for the story. Who? The shepherd judge, the son of man. The passage will talk about Jesus coming. He's sitting on the throne. He's in the, he's in the judge's position. And the references here will point out what, how much of a shepherd he is. The cross is the intersection of the shepherd judge. The love and the mercy and the grace and the justice, the wrath and the fulfillment of the full character of God. And Jesus sits there on the throne, exalted, having come back and returned as one who rules over all. And Hebrews says, what kind of throne does he sit on? The throne of grace. We'll talk about the least of these. This passage is used so often to inspire, encourage, support, resource, missions, and rightly so. Everything in here applies across the board to the nature of what it means to live generously as a believer. And this particular passage is about generosity towards other believers. He speaks often, the least of these, my brethren. He's identifying with the treatment of people who belong to him, speaking to a group of people, the Pharisees and Sadducees, who want to rid themselves of the presence of the people who belong to him. The sheep and the goats... And honestly, if, I don't, if we don't understand any first century culture, this seems very trite, doesn't it? We're going to talk about people's eternal destiny using the metaphor of barnyard animals. 
seems very uh, inadequate unless you understand that the nature of the people he are talking with are deeply familiar with the lifestyle of shepherds and understand that a Palestinian shepherd at night, at the end of the day, when things have come to a closure at the end of a day, will send the sheep in one place and the goats in another because they need to be in different places that night. When is this? It's the final judgment. There are many different ways that scripture intersects this theme of the final judgment. This is one of them. And why? Always. Always, always. Look at him. Look at him. Look at him. To the praise of his glorious grace. So with all that background, to rescue us from a simplistic religious works story that does not reflect the simple gospel truth of this story, let's dive in. Matthew chapter 25, we're going to start with verse 31. Matthew 25, 31, and uh, immediately we start to recognize some of the things we've been talking about. When the Son of Man comes in his glory and the angels with him, then he will sit on his glorious throne. And before him will be gathered all the nations, all of humanity. And he will separate people one from another as a shepherd separates the sheep from the goats. And he will place the sheep on his right, but the goats on the left. I think you understand the right hand is considered a place of honor in this culture. Then the king will say to those on the right, now listen to this language. Before we talk about what they did, before we talk about their generosity, before we talk about the expression of their lives and how they related to others, we start with this statement. Come, you who are blessed by my father. Inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. Headline. Everything that's about to happen flows from God the Father's blessing, the gift of his kingdom as an inheritance before any of these people did any of the things that they're attributed as doing that causes them to move towards his right hand. Are you with me on this one? This is a super important thing. The foundation for this passage is not some people got it right and some people got it wrong and you better get it right because if you don't get it right, you're headed to hell. Not denying the reality of hell or separation from God at all, as we will see. But the point is not do more. The point is who he is. And then the question becomes, and how's that shaping your life? Because it will become obvious that if this is the truth, if this is the grace you've received, if you are the recipient of such lavish, rich generosity, and it's going to work its way out in how you care for others. For I was hungry and you gave me food. I was thirsty and you gave me drink. I was a stranger and you welcomed me. I was naked and you clothed me. I was sick and you visited me. I was in prison and you came to me. That's how you lived out of this. You did for others what I did for what I have done spiritually and personally for you, you invested in the reality of the real world. Then the righteous will answer him saying, Lord, like when did we see you hungry and feed you or thirsty and give you drink? We don't remember having any conversation with you about it. We don't remember seeing you in any of this. And when did we see you a stranger and welcome you or naked and clothe you? It's not that we wouldn't have done that, but we, didn't, we just never, it never, we don't remember this. And when did you see, we see you sick or in prison and, and visit you? Like, when did, when did this ever happen? And he's, the king will answer them, truly I say to you, as you did it to one of the least of these, my brothers, you did it to me. You acted in accordance with who you were and who I am to you. This judgment is not a scorecard. It's not a grade, a, a grade card, a report card. It's not a, a review. It is the observation of what happened to these people because of who they were in relationship to God the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. 
and the grace they were given and the grace they shared became a part of actually how they lived their lives. J.W. Alexander says that Jesus is pointing to these people that he refers to as the sheep as a way to place them before the angels in honor. In honor of what? The Father and his goodness. They are heirs, and what has been bestowed on them is the generosity of grace that they have found a way to begin to cultivate. Not perfectly, not to the extent of earning righteousness, not to the extent of making them like Jesus in every way, but there's just something happening in them that is rooted in, finds its source in, the extravagant, wealth of riches and grace given to us by Jesus. So this last week, I'm, I'm kind of traveling down a variety of different roads of learning and praying. And I, I, for whatever reason, I don't even remember how I got there, I landed on the story of Corey Tim Boom. Now, because we have uh, folks in our congregation, particularly younger, who may, I'm not sure what this story is. I'm going to take it three or four minutes and kind of share it with you. So this particular picture is of the Tim Boom family. They're Dutch. Um, and this is uh, Casper, the, the dad. Uh, this is Elizabeth, the oldest sister. Here's the brother. And then here is Corey Timbo. And the, the gist of the story is, excuse me, I got to mark, mark that. The, the gist of the story is this. When the Gestapo occupied their village in the Netherlands uh, in World War II, the decision made by the Tim Boom family was, we're going to start hiding our neighbors who are Jews from the Gestapo. And I've had the privilege, I both heard Corey Tim Boom speak in public personally, and I had the privilege of having traveled and been in their home and seen The Hiding Place, which is the, the name of the book and the movie that comes from this story. And these were, this was a remarkable, simple life they were living. It wasn't lavish by wealth standards at all. They were just living their lives. But when the Gestapo started coming after their Jewish neighbors, they took those Jewish neighbors in and they hid them at the risk of their lives, which ultimately will happen. Ultimately, they will be dragged from their home. The father, who's 84, will live 10 days. The son uh, will survive the war, will be, be terribly ill and never, never the same in his health and will lose his son in a concentration camp. The sister Betsy, the older sister, uh, will die after 10 months in a concentration camp with Corey by her side. And the story that is so powerful, there's so many powerful layers to this, but a couple of them are this. One, in the concentration camp, uh, Corey Tim Boom describes her and Betsy meeting Jesus very personally and caring for the other women and bringing hope and life and bread and risking their lives to care for others. And that didn't happen because one day they just decided to be generous. So I wanted to understand more about this. And I go back and I look at more of their story and you can begin to see that they spent, they were a generous family long before the Gestapo showed up. They'd been building the muscle of caring for people in their community. They'd been building the muscle of caring for God's people. They'd been building the muscle of thinking about those who had need. And so when the Gestapo comes up, comes along, it does not cause them to become generous. It reveals their generosity in Christ. Those are two very different ways of thinking. May I say to all of us, we can all build that muscle. We can all build that muscle, even now. Without the threat of life or of death or without someone coming to take our things or, and, and, and Americans were just like, we're so extraordinarily comfortable. If you don't know that about yourself, I ask you, please consider how comfortable it is. You say, but it's so hard. Yeah, I understand. And some of you have some heart that do not, I'm not minimizing those who are unemployed dealing with disease, dealing with hard things, not minimizing at all. And the nature of our culture as a whole is comfort. That's why we make jokes about 
spring forward and it raining. Because we, let me say this, I've said it on my podcast, comfort is an idol in my life. I do not like to be uncomfortable. I actually think I deserve not to be. And the gospel calls us to a very different way of looking at life. One of the stories I love, and we'll move back into Matthew. One of the stories I love with Corey Tim Boom is uh, there comes a knock at the door, and the man, she opens the door, and a man pleads with her, would you please help me? My wife, we've been caring for the Jews, and the Gestapo have my wife. And I've I've talked to one policeman, and he said, if I'll give him a bribe of 600 guilders, which is $650, $700 in the 1940s, a substantial amount of money. If I'll give him that bribe, he'll make sure my wife is let go, and she won't have to go to prison or the concentration camp. I've heard, Miss Tim Boone, that you care for your neighbors and for the Jews, and we do. And would you please, would you please give me the money? I don't have any money to rescue my wife. Corey Tim Boom knows she has 200 guilders. She has a third of it. It's a substantial amount of money. And she says, come back in an hour. So she takes every, everything she's saved in a time when her whole life is threatened. Takes everything she's saved and then goes to all of her friends and says, this is a good woman. We must save her. This is a good woman. We must collect this money. We must make it possible for her not to end up in a concentration camp. And through the generosity of God's people and this family, they came up with the $600 and gave it to this man to rescue his wife. This is the generous generous heart of which Matthew 25 speaks. Not going to try to make a name for oneself, not trying to do some splashy thing, just being available to see what you might have to offer in a world where that is needed. Come back to that story later, but let's go back to Matthew 25. Then he will say to those on his left, now let's stop here for a second. Do you notice that the first thing he does is speaks to the sheep to exalt the grace of the father in calling these his sheep? Because the goats, the left people on the left here, are going to look at the sheep and say, there's nothing special about them. And the sheep will say, there's nothing special about us except his grace. But those on the left, depart from me, you cursed into the eternal fire prepared for the devil and his angels. For I was hungry and you gave me no food. I was thirsty and you gave me no drink. I was a stranger, you did not welcome me. Naked and you did not clothe me. Sick and in prison and you did not visit me. Then they also will answer saying, Lord, when when did we see you hungry or thirsty or a stranger or naked or sick or in prison and did not minister? They have the same question. If we'd have known it was you, we would have done it. This is the rich young ruler. What do we need to do? What do I need to do to be saved? If you just told me, I would have given you food. I I just didn't know it was you. I would have done it. I would have done it for you. He says, truly, I say to you, as you did not do it to one of the least of these, you did not do it to me. And these will go away into eternal punishment, but the righteous into eternal life. This is the the separation point of eternal destiny that scripture is so clear about that there is a place for those who have encountered experience been saved by his grace and a place for those who haven't. There is a dividing line. And it appears that it's based on what people have done for Jesus at first glance. Until you hear the whole story, And what you begin to understand, it's actually based on what people have done because of Jesus. Because those who do not go to be with Jesus or the Father, who go to eternal punishment, are doing so because they never had the relationship of experiencing the grace in their lives from which they began to become people of grace to others. They are religious. They are transactional. And as a matter of fact, as we said earlier, they're going to go after Jesus' people very soon. They're going after Jesus. They're going after his disciples. They're going after everybody. What are they going to do to those who are vulnerable, who follow Jesus? Take them out. 
And Jesus says, to the praise of his glorious grace, I have called you to live in generosity. This is consistent with scripture. For I desire steadfast love and not sacrifice, the knowledge of God rather than burnt offerings, he says in Hosea. I am looking for you to begin to love with the love with which you've been lived, you've been loved. And one of the ways I'll know that you've been loved with my love is you'll actually love others. You show up with your religious offering and you don't care about anything around you except you. You show up to go through the rituals and you don't even know me. I need to tell you that is not what it means to be in relationship with God the Father. Now, are there uh, a call here to examine our lives? Yes, and we're going to do that in a moment. We are going to examine and think about this in our own lives. Where is the grace and love of Jesus working its way out in your life to those who are vulnerable or in need or in some way your gift of grace to them and love and resource would make it possible for them to experience more of Jesus. And your two traps are this. One, you don't think you have anything to offer. And two, you don't think it would make a difference if you did. And that's a lie from the enemy, straight up. You have Jesus and offering Jesus in the most simple, hidden ways. No selfie, no TikTok, no email, no consideration, no public testimony, just being Jesus to the people around you in the ways you can. Jesus says, that's what I was talking about. That's what I meant. That's what it looks like to belong to me. It's uncalculating. There's no thought of return. There's no reward. You don't gain something in your image. You don't gain anything in your reputation. You don't, you're not looking to do something to get something. You're expressing what you've already received in Jesus, and that's the story that he's telling. It will be the story of the New Testament following Jesus' death and resurrection. In Acts 13 to 15, Paul will be sent on his first missionary journey, and he and Silas will head into the world. And in Galatians 2.10, he reflects on that moment. He said, only they ask us to remember the poor, the very thing I was eager to do. As Paul preached the gospel, take it to the Gentiles, let the world know who Jesus is, and do not forget to take care of those who are without Jesus would describe them, the naked, the hungry, the stranger, the prisoner. Again, Paul goes uh, out into his journeys later after the first, after the first uh, missionary trip. He comes out, and now Jerusalem is hurting. Once Jerusalem was helping the world, now Jerusalem with famine and with persecution, they're in deep, deep hurt. And Paul reflects on this in Romans chapter 15, verse 26. For Macedonia and Achaia have been pleased to make some contribution for the poor among the saints at Jerusalem. There is no extension of the gospel without the caring of the least of these recorded in our scriptures. It's always, always accompanied. And one of the things that we want to be as a church is to celebrate the goodness of of the generosity of these people, of this church. And we're going to do that uh, later in the spring. We're actually, part of a whole Sunday will be the celebration of the generosity. And then we're also going to say, what more might we have to offer that we've not yet imagined? So when you see a generosity come, series coming in the spring, if you're new to fellowship and you're like, oh, here it comes, here comes the big thing, give more, make more happen, they've got this big thing they're going to do, and we want more money, No. I always ask of the Lord, I, I say to the Lord, we need to speak about generosity because you want to take us somewhere, but could our finances be in a really good shape when we do? Because I don't want anybody to think I'm talking about generosity because I'm trying to get their money for the budget. I can go right now on Amazon and buy five books to tell me how to manipulate you out of more money, and it would work. And it has nothing to do with the gospel. And by the way, we're doing quite well. Y'all are so generous and so gracious. We're doing quite well. We need to keep doing well because we're a family. We need to take care of our budget. It's important to take care of our budget. Your staff thinks so, all right? It's important to take care of your budget. But I've told you often, often, in case you haven't heard me, let me say it. There's more than enough money here to take care of the budget 
and a whole lot more. And let's give that away. Let's be invested in our community. Let's find the naked, the hungry, the imprisoned, the stranger, and all other manner of vulnerabilities that exist out there. And let's be Jesus to the world. And we have more. I love that we already sermon, we, God wants more for us. You know what else? He wants more for the world through us. He wants more for the world through us. And it's actually there that we find out how abundant grace is. The lavishness of God is only fully understand when we share what we have received. Listen to how Paul speaks to the Corinthians. Now, brothers, we want you to know about the grace that God has given us, given the churches of Macedonia. This is what he's talking about in Romans 15. In the terrible ordeal they suffered, the Macedonian church, their abundant joy and deep poverty overflowed into rich generosity. That is like six to seven hours worth of teaching right there. Their abundant joy and deep poverty overflowed into rich generosity. For I testify that they gave according to their ability and even beyond it. Of their own accord, they earnestly pleaded with us for the privilege of sharing in the service to the saints. And not only did they do as we expected, but they gave themselves first to the Lord and then to us because it was the will of God. And this is what Jesus is saying in Matthew 25. These people had given themselves over to the grace and the goodness of God and then found a way to participate in that grace and goodness in the world and among his people. So we urge Titus to help complete your act of grace just as he had shared it, but just as you excel in everything. This is an incredible verse. Corinthians, like you guys are, you're rocking it. Like you, I want to say to you, I'm so proud of you for how you're growing in faith, in speech, in knowledge, in complete earnestness, and the love we inspired in you. I can see it growing. See that you also excel in this grace of giving. It's not full until it overflows into some form of generosity. I'm not making a demand, but I am testing the sincerity of your love in comparison to the earnestness of others. And here's what he's saying. I'm just asking you, are you in on offering the generosity you've been given to the world? You can't compare amounts. You can't compare. Some people have tons of resources. Others do not. Some people have a lot of margin of time. Others do not. Some are positioned a place of influence so they can move things to people who need things. Some are not. It's not about that. It's about giving ourselves to the will of God and then whatever he calls us individually and as a body to do. And since COVID happened, we have been reimagining our place in our community and in the world, locally and globally. And God is giving favor to those things in an incredible way. I want you to know more about them. I want to invite you into them, but I want to do so as an expression of who he is to you, not something we're doing because we're supposed to, because you can't demand generosity. It's a gift of joy. And we cannot forget what God said in Hosea. I desire, I desire love, not sacrifice. The knowledge of God, not your rituals. I'm going to say this with all my love. This is too easy if you think this is Christianity. The teaching of the word and the worship we do is so important for the building up of the body and faith to give us right truth, to renew our mind. It's so important. But if this is your expression right here, what you're doing right now of your faith in Jesus, you have either never known or have forgotten what he's done for you. You've either never known, or you have forgotten who he is. That's the story he's trying to tell. His grace has impact on how we live in the real world. For you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for our, your sakes he became poor, so that through his poverty, you through his poverty might become rich. This is our Savior, becoming poor, that he might make us rich in every spiritual blessing. And that example is what we do. And it's not just about finances. Yes, financial generosity tells a lot about where our heart is. We'll explore that. 
There's also social generosity about being generous with the place we may occupy that makes it possible for us to serve and open doors for others who don't have that space. If you want to know more about that, you can listen to Life Reframed that we dropped last week. Laura and I talked about rights and understanding what rights, how they should be looked at, both those who don't have them and those who do. It's about your, your experience. You have so many experiences to offer. Some of you have lost children. Some of you have been divorced. Some of you have had horrendous diseases. Some of you have been abused. Some of you have, have, have had a child and go through horribly difficult things relationally. I, I could go on and on. Some of you have had educational experiences that are beyond what we can even fathom and imagine. Some of you have such social capital in this community that on any given day, any given need you have, you know who to call and they'll help you. We must expand our understanding of what has been entrusted to us and find ways for those who do not have to experience that as well. That's the gospel. Jesus said the poor need the church. You know what else? The church need the poor. Otherwise, we can never understand fully together the gospel. Since last year, you were the first not only to give, but even to have a desire uh, have such a desire. Now finish the work so that you may complete it just as eagerly as you began according to your means. In other words, we all lose steam, don't we? We make these ideas or commitments and, we're going to, and we lose steam because we're trying to make something happen rather than receive what's been given and then just pour that out. This is about receiving and pouring out. It's not about making something happen. For if the eagerness is there, the gift is acceptable according to what one has, not according to what he does not have. This is not about amount, comparison, competition. This is about faithful stewardship. Generosity never earns salvation in Christ. Salvation in Christ is always evidenced by generosity. And the grace to keep learning to be a generous people. Just the grace to keep learning. Not getting it right, not getting it all the time, just to keep learning to be a generous people. So this week, Corey Tim Boom taught me again about generosity. And I want to finish the story. Remember the man that knocked at the door? She gave everything she had, including all of her friends' money too. Later in a concentration camp, a woman asked her, do you know who betrayed you? She said, no, I have no idea. It was that man. The man to whom you gave everything you had. He was set up by the Gestapo to expose you, and he managed to make a good bit of money doing it. She said, in that moment, I had such hatred in my heart, such hatred. And she said, I remembered Romans 5, that this does not accomplish the good of the Father. And she said, so I gave my hate over to Jesus, and he taught me to forgive that man. Because she had a Savior who was betrayed for 30 pieces of silver who knew exactly what she was talking about. and yet forgave. The generosity must come from the source of all grace and goodness. And when it does, it becomes abundant. You say, Lyric, that's a great story. It's not exactly this passage. Oh, yes, it is, because this man, after the war, will become condemned to be executed for his betrayal. And Corey Tim Boom will write to him in prison and say, you're about to be killed. You have nothing to lose. But I've forgiven you. I want you to know. And so will Jesus if you'll just turn to him and be reconciled to God and you will be with him forever. And his response was, if you could forgive me for that, then I want this Jesus and I've asked him to forgive me so that I might know him as my Savior. 
brothers and sisters, you're not going to manufacture that and neither am I. But that's the Jesus who owns us as his beloved. That's the gospel. That's the extent to which he came to us, which then becomes the extent to which we can enter into and engage the world if we would but remember who he is and not settle for being good Christians going to a good church. God has more for the world from us. And guess what happens when you do it? You get filled back in with more of him, which is the whole point to the praise of his grace. The worship team is going to come up now and close us in a song. Let's stand as we prepare to worship. Uh, I've been working on this generosity series for the spring for several months. I'm, I'm, I'm really excited about it because I believe it's going to teach us more of who he is and invite more of him into us. We might imagine and reimagine who we are as a people with this grace that's been given to us. Lord, as we now enter into this moment of worship, will you do what happens in Matthew 25 where it's look at him, look at him, the shepherd judge on the throne, offering himself on behalf of a people who did not deserve it, didn't even know what most of it was even going on. But because of the blessing of the Father in the fullness of time, we will one day receive the full inheritance. Lord, teach us that our access now to that inheritance is by living in the grace of generosity. From which will flow, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. This was Jesus' prayer, it's our prayer, and now we offer ourselves in praise to him.